Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is our quarterly webinar series, uh, CIO's Corner, quarterly update with our Chief Investment Officer, Chris Gauthier. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, I'm Amanda Sylvia, and I am the Client Service Associate for Stonehearth. I've been with the firm for five years now, and my primary role includes client service, marketing, and compliance. I do want to start off with just a few housekeeping items on your GoToMeeting taskbar, you should see a section titled Questions. Please feel free to submit your questions throughout the course of the webinar. I will be monitoring all of those questions and I will ask Chris to answer as many as he can as time allows at the end of the webinar. If we do happen to run low on time um, and we don't get to your question, Chris or myself will reach out to you directly and we'll make sure that we'll get your question answered. Now I want to introduce our speaker for today, Chris. Gauthier is Stonehearth's Chief Investment Officer. He brings more than 15 years of investment experience to our firm, working with both institutional and individual investors. He is responsible for setting the firm's overall investment policy and strategy, including directing our asset allocation, investment risk, research, and portfolio management functions. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you, Amanda, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, as Amanda said, to our Q1 CAO Corner webinar. Uh, before starting, um, you know, we here at Stonehearth would like to wish everyone good health and express our deepest sympathies for anyone impacted either directly or indirectly by this horrible coronavirus that's out there. I mean, we would also like to give, you know, our deepest thanks to our frontline workers, you know, and not just the medical professionals who are out there day in and day out saving lives. But for those out there every day, front and center of this virus, trying to make our lives a little bit better during this, I mean, for all they do, we really want to send them a tremendous amount of thanks. Um, now, turning to a little bit of a happier note, um, I would like to wish everybody a happy Earth Day. Um, that is today. And with everything going on, it's easy to miss, but it is Earth Day. Um, what I find amazing is we talk about the environmental movement here in America. Um, we tend to think of it as something new, something that's, you know, just kind of bubbling up recently. But when you look at Earth Day, it's actually the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. So back way back in 1970, we had concerns about the environment. So to me, it's just amazing. So I wish everyone a happy Earth Day and everyone can just do their part as they see fit for that. So with that, let's jump right in to the presentation. Again, we always talk about what we're gonna cover today. Cover asset class performance, you know, not good, but a few rays of light here and there talk a little bit about the investment environment, um, cloudy to say the least, and finally a little bit about portfolio positioning, you know, how a portfolio is positioned to manage risk and to take advantage of opportunities. And yes, there are some opportunities out there in the marketplace. So we gotta think about our investment philosophy when we go through this presentation. And it's something I always like to do and jump out of in front, because again, it gives us a framework for our discussion. It's kind of how we view the markets. It's the foundation of everything we do here. So it's really built on five pillars. First pillar is mean reversion. I mean, things revolve around the mean, go up and down. Price matters, we're driven by value. You know, what you pay for something drives returns. Look at exposure to core factors, think about quality, momentum, value, off a of long-term excess returns above the market. Diversification is still the only free lunch, and it's been crystal clear during this crisis that diversification is still free lunch and still is meaningful for a client portfolios. And finally, risk is not stationary. It really fluctuates throughout the, throughout the market cycle, and you must adjust portfolios to take advantage of that risk. So that's what we're basing our analysis on, and let's jump into quarterly performance. So what we're looking at here is a list of asset classes. Anytime you see red, think about fixed income, so corporate bonds, treasuries. Anytime you see yellow, think alternatives, think managed futures, you know, merger ob fund, gold, the US dollar, oil. Um, anytime you see blue, that's US equities, green, international equities. So basically, no surprises here, it was a flight to safety in the quarter. And then really what we saw was treasuries outperform alternatives, and that's this 22% return right here, long-term treasuries, but even short-term treasuries, think one to three months, returned almost 3% during the quarter, a great return given what we saw in the equity markets. Alternatives, outperformed credit, credit outperformed equity, US outperformed international, large outperformed small, 
And really big takeaway is there really was no protection from broad fixed income securities as anything credit related was down. So when I think about credit, we think about anything in the fixed income world that is not US government related because that's the risk free rate. So you think about corporate bonds, they were actually down 3%. Preferred stock down 10%. Floating rates, which are short term loans based on collateral down 12%. High yield bonds, junk down 13%. So again, there was this massive dislocation in the credit markets. So it just wasn't an equity experience downfall in Q1. It was also spread throughout fixed income land, which is not something you'd see constantly. It usually does go down, but not as much. And you can even see the munis, you know, muni bonds lending to municipalities, this lending to cities was actually down for the quarter. You know, so again, looking at the positives, duration as represented by US treasuries here, long-term treasuries, and a small piece of the alt world. So we saw gold rise, which is to be expected during crises, and managed futures. And now I'm gonna inner channel my inner Bill Belichick here, and he always says, do your job. Well, we always expect some of our holdings to do their job, and managed futures are expected to help us during these massive declines in the market, and managed futures definitely did their job in the quarter, rising almost three and a quarter percent. So again, ugly across the board. Um, but again, a few small pieces of hope here and there. And the one thing to kind of to close out here on the small caps down 32%, that's the worst quarter ever for small caps. Even during the global financial crisis, there's never been that bad for small caps, which is amazing to me. Taking a step back and taking out the yearly performance, the colors are the same. So, you know, red's fixed income, blue's US equity, green's international equity, and, and so forth. Performance, very similar to the quarter. You know, as the move we saw in March was so extreme on all these asset classes, it basically overwhelmed the other 11 months worth of performance. So when we look at performance, treasuries outperformed, treasuries and also still the place to be, credit outperformed the US equity market, US equity market still outperformed international, and large still outperformed small. The one piece that was a little bit different was there was some positive in the credit markets. So we saw some corporate bonds up here, almost 6.74% over the past year. We saw some unis up 4%. So there was a little bit of difference, but in general, you can see it lines up pretty much with what happened in Q1. The only really flight to safety and really safe havens was gold, long-term treasuries, and again, managed futures providing some nice positive returns during these equity sell-offs we've seen here. As you, we said in our investment philosophy, we look at the world through the factor lens. So what we're looking at here is the factors that we look at in the US equity markets, value, quality, momentum, high yield, and S&P. You, know, you can see it sells off of the equities market. No surprise there. Momentum was the best factor. They saw a return only down 15% and it's only down 15% is the best performing, This is a, which is amazing to me. Um, that really was due to its overweight and large cap growth stocks. Think about Amazon, Microsoft, Netflix, you know, and that which held up a little bit better in the cur current environment. Quality, basically in line with the marketplace. So really no um, excess return from quality. And Really no surprise, given the economic dislocation we saw, value was the worst performing factor, down almost 30%. What was a little bit surprising is we did see some underperformance from the higher yielding stocks, um, down here almost 24% compared to 19 for the US equity market. Um, I think that'll become clear why that is and when we take when we take a closer look at corporations' expected use of cash a little bit later. Um, sneak preview, we don't think companies are gonna earn enough money to pay the current rates of dividends. So let's take a look at volatility in the quarter, and it's absolutely off the chart. I mean, it's the highest we have seen since the global financial crisis. And what we're looking at here on the bottom pane here is the VIX. So, you know, think about it as the fair index. As this rises, there's more volatility in the marketplace. The lower it is, the lower the vol. Compare that to the S&P over the same time frame. So you can see S&P falls off, volatility rises all throughout since the great financial crisis. Move over all, all the way over to the right to see what happened here. And it was just absolutely amazing, off the charts compared to what we've seen since the global financial crisis. The peak in the global financial crisis on the VIX was 80.9. We didn't quite get there, but we're and we're actually actually in the 50s. So we had a nice big comeback. We're back down to the 50s. But again, given prior history, still very elevated, still at extremes. And it's very easy to see that what we're experiencing in price performance and also in this crisis is not like the recent bouts we have experienced in the short term past, going back to 2010. You know, it is different and sometimes things are different. And this looks like one of those events where it's not like what we've seen 
in recent history. It looks different, it looks, smells different. And we'll show you why we think that is going forward. So again, had this massive sell-off. It was amazing, it was the fastest collapse on record. So the red right here is the fastest 30% drawdown in history at 22 days. We haven't seen one faster. Um, the closest example is the Great Depression, which we never want to be anywhere near the Great Depression or compare ourselves to the Great Depression. And, but it's just amazing, three periods of 30% drawdowns in the Great Depression over a few years, absolutely amazing. But given the recent history, it more resembles the one we saw in 1987, which is you know the portfolio insurance Black Monday crash. Um, so that's really the, the closest example. You know, and really haven't seen this type of action um, since the Great Depression. So if we use that as a guide, another ex extreme sell-off is quite possible since we, we have seen that in the past. Now I know the market's been rising a little bit lately. It's been a lot, little vol volatile, but we have saw a nice bounce back off the lows from March 23rd. And a good thing to keep in mind, that's not out of the ordinary. We have seen this before in previous bear markets, If and, the, and this is not strange. So we look at this, I don't know what color you want to call it, aqua line or lime green. This is the great financial crisis. The blue line is a dot-com blow up. And you can see that during these crises in these bear markets, we saw periods of you know, bounce backs in the equity markets, really strong bounce backs. And look over here, we've seen gains of 10%, 15%, back in the dot com, even 20%. And we compare the one that we're seeing now, it's up almost 17%. So again, right in line with what we've seen throughout previous history, nothing out of the ordinary, nothing that we haven't seen before. And then we kind of look at the closest one, the one that, that stands out is 1987, again, two days to return 15%, and we look at 17% in almost three days here. So again, it seems like 1987 is a good equivalent for what we're seeing here, and you know, a good boilerplate for what's probably going to happen. I don't think that's the case, and I don't think it's gonna be a good guide for managing this crisis. And the reason why is recessions. Um, you know, because 1987 had no recession. So we look back here at previous bear markets, 1987, Flash crashes right here. We saw the duration six months, no recession. 1987 crash program, no recession. That was in, sorry, that was the 1962 Cuban crisis, but financial crisis, and then 1987 flash crash right here, no recession. So all those shallow durations, bear markets, really did not have a recession associated with it. You know, so really without a recession. A V-shaped recovery is very possible. We've seen that throughout history. We saw that here. We saw that here. We saw that in 1987 flash crash. But if history is any guide, a sell-off with a recession is deeper and lasts a lot longer than one without. And we can see that throughout this data points that if you're associated with a bear market and a recession, the depth and duration is a lot longer than it's associated without. Um, and we'll go through the economic data further along in this presentation, but rest assured, it is tough to come up with any type of scenario that doesn't include an economic recession in this crisis. So we've kind of took a look a little bit at the performance in previous bear markets. I want to take a step back and look at oil here for a second. Usually we don't go through the commodity complex too much. We usually don't invest in it. Um, but I think it's interesting to take a look at oil right now because it's driving a lot of some of the market performance we're seeing. And it's amazing to me that it's back to the lows of 1999. Um, this is as of quarter end, so it's at $20 a barrel. It's actually lower than that now. It's about $15 a barrel, so this is not getting any better. Um, this chart just amazes me, the, the extreme volatility we're seeing in oil. I mean, back in 2008, it was at 150 bucks. Even back 2014, it was over $100, and now it's at $15. What might surprise people to look over here in terms of production, and this is the first chart we're seeing here, is the greatest growth in production is coming from the US, and we are energy self-sufficient. We produce about 20.8 gallon um, barrels a day, millions of barrels a day, and we consume about 20.7, but that's going down definitely. So again, when we look at this chart, we look at the price that action we're seeing in oil, you know, people want to make this thing complicated. I like to keep things simple as possible to explain things. You know, it's just too much oil and not enough demand. You know, that's pretty much the issue. That's why price is going down. It's just too much oil sloshing around from all this production growth and not enough consumption. And that's going to be lower given what we see in the crisis. So how do you cure this, right? You know, either supply needs to be cut or demand needs to increase. And looking around the economic environment, what we're seeing in the crisis, nobody flying, nobody driving, I really don't see demand coming back 
to previous levels. So supply must be the cure to elevate oil prices. But there's always a trade-off. That will entail severe economic contraction for the U.S. economy. When you think about oil, getting it out of the ground, it's a lot of money going in, a lot of capital. It's very capital-intensive business, generates a lot of economic, economic activity. It's also very labor-intensive, employs a lot of people at very decent salaries, doing a lot of work that creates a lot of economic activity. So not just pulling oil out of the ground and direct consequences, there's a whole bunch of indirect economic activity that accounts for that. It's a very highly economic sensitive industry that creates a lot of economic activity in the US. Once you kind of understand it from that standpoint, you can see why people focus and certain people in government focus on this a lot. It drives a lot of the economic activity in the US. So that's taking a look at oil. Let's turn to the fixed income market. As we saw, it was down over the quarter, but you know, I don't think it got cheap enough yet. What we're looking at here, like we always look at, is the fixed income spread analysis. So what we're looking at in these lines is different pieces of the fixed income market, mortgage-backed securities, asset-backed securities, think credit cards, cars, commercial mortgage-backed securities, think malls, apartment buildings, corporate bonds, pretty easy to understand, floating rate loans, short-term loans backed by some kind of collateral, and so forth. We're looking at here as has ex how much its trades spread to the U.S. Treasury rate. So how much more interest investors demand if they're going to invest in a riskier part of the market? Think about this as a P/E ratio. How expensive is fixed income? When this is wide, when it's out here like 1581 for the commercial back, that means it's very cheap. When it's low, that means it tends to be expensive. And you can see that it's not the extreme expensive. You know. The max spread we saw is the global financial crisis, which is all these numbers up here, way back in 08 and 09. We're not even close there. But it still shows expensive given the current economic, pic economic picture. So again, given what we're seeing in the marketplace, we would, like to, we would want to see these go up a little bit higher before we could say the fixed income market is very inexpensive. It is still not cheap. Why, given everything we're seeing in this place? There's a price insensitive buyer in the marketplace. It really not based on fundamentals. And who is it? It's the Fed. And we'll talk a little bit about what they've done, but the Fed basically came in and is out there buying corporate bonds, is out there buying commercial backed securities. So if you have a buyer who doesn't care about price and doesn't care about risk, they just care about getting it onto their balance sheet, they're willing to pay anything and depress these spreads. Um, so that's what's happening here and why we don't think fixed income credit is cheap enough yet. So let's look at the equity market. And we look at the equity market through the lens of the CAPE ratio. CAPE is a cyclically adjusted PE ratio or more commonly referred to as a Schiller PE ratio. Um, all it is is basically price over earnings. I'm sure everybody knows the price of a stock, price of an index, earnings, how much earnings the underlying assets are, are generating. The CAPE just takes that and spreads that over historical 10 year period and adjusts for inflation. It gives you a better longer term picture of the valuations in the asset classes. And when we look around here, even given that sell off we saw in Q1, we're really still expensive. And we still haven't seen the full negative impact to corporate earnings. I mean, that has not been factored in yet to this ratio because it's a trailing 10 years. So we haven't seen those earnings come through yet. I mean, we look across all countries, all the equities across the world, we have EFR. Think France, think Europe, think Japan, emerging markets, U.S. large, U.S. small. We are seeing some value in the international markets and the emerging markets here. Yeah. EM is definitely the most attractive. I don't think international is extreme enough yet, given what we're seeing with the virus. EM, as we'll see our portfolio positioning, I do think is an attractive. Again, given the valuation support, doesn't mean that it's all hunky-dory from here, but it has a lot more valuation support and is a lot better position to grow than some of the other things we're seeing in the US equity market. So that's what we look at from the historical standpoint. And we wanna move on to the expected economic impacts from the coronavirus and see if, as always, we can find the signal through the noise. So I love this chart. This chart is from Moody's and they put this together when the, when the virus first hit. And it basically look, breaks down by industries and not doesn't try to quantify what's happening, but just gives you what's the most exposed to this crisis, what's moderate and low. And look at the highest exposures, basically consumer driven, which is no surprise. Apparel, automotive supplies, consumer durables, gaming, the airlines, retail, again, everything we'd expect. Look at the moderate exposure, 
You can understand how that goes into beverages, chemicals, manufacturing, oil and gas, and the low exposure. Even the low exposure packaging, pharmaceuticals, real estate, it's still having an impact. It's just a little bit lower than the direct high impact here. And there are some positives. So again, there are some winners in this in terms of internet service companies. Think about Netflix and the subscribers, at least in the short term, Amazon, um, gold mining stocks as gold goes up. So again, the takeaway is that the direct impact is going to be massive. You know, how massive is this direct impact going to be? Well, one way to look at it is from those highest exposure industries, and that is the consumer. So what we're looking at here is those breakdowns of those highest exposure industries. You can see retail and food, ex beverages, restaurants, entertainment, hotels, which is all including that high exposure. You can see that that makes up in 2019 almost 20% of GDP, almost 20% of jobs. You know, it's, so it's amazing when you look at the adjusted direct highest exposure impact, you're talking almost a quarter of GDP could be impacted by this. And this is amazing because the, the, as we'll see, activity just dropped off and fell off. And we're starting to see a few signs of this in the marketplace now. So again, think about how this impact creeps into the rest of the economy. 70% of the GDP is driven by consumption, you know, and consumption is going nowhere but down. You know, it's interesting, I did start seeing the first time, talk about bankruptcies. JC Penney was a little bit, but they were actually be able to survive for a little for a little bit longer here, but I think they will eventually, but they got by. But Neiman Marcus, um, another, you know, storied retail giant, um, is de is declaring bankruptcy. They're in negotiations right now. So you're starting to see the dominoes fall in terms of the retail space and we're starting to see that impact. And speaking of that direct impact, let's take a look at retail sales. It's one of the first numbers we get. Um, this is data through March. This is not quarterly, this is monthly data, so it's a little more um, updated. And it's just amazing how you can see activity just fell off the face of the earth, down 6.7. We haven't seen anything like this since the global financial crisis drop this steep. And again, it's interesting to remember that the isolation and social distancing, which is affecting this, the retail sales, this really only began in earnest the last week of March. You know, so again, this is really only one week out of four weeks that we had really had no economic activity. So again, you have to think, given the timing of this and the data we're looking at, looking at, how low will this really go? I do think we we're in for, we're gonna revisit the lows here we saw in the global financial crisis and maybe even lower. I mean, the impact is, go impact is going to be massive. So let's take a look at employment. What we're looking here is unemployment insurance weekly claims. So again, this high frequency data stuff that is we can look at real quick and almost in real time. These amount of people applying for unemployment insurance is a four week moving average. And you can see right here that it's 4.2 million. Um, the first thing that should stick out in your mind is we go back and if, for those people who remember the great financial crisis 2000, 2009, how bad that was for the job picture, we're off the charts. We just blew right by that. And we're actually going even higher since the week after this came out last week, I think 5 million people applied for insurance. So again, this is only going higher. When you take these numbers and you look at a chart, it doesn't really sink in sometimes. But so really th think about this. There are currently over 20 million people unemployed in this country. Given the workforce of about 165 million, it's almost 10% of the workforce is unemployed. It's just amazing. Think about, well, we won't know about, but the Great Depression, the max was 25%. So again, we're not near the Great Depression levels, but it is a massive impact to the economy, all these people unemployed. And then we got to think about when this economy opens up. You know, even this opens up tomorrow, life is going to be very different than it was before the crisis. You know, do all these people go back to work? You know, I'm not so sure that's gonna happen, unfortunately. And that has severe consequences for, um, the economic environment going forward. Lastly, look at one more economic impact, we look at air travel. So what we're looking at here is directly from the TSA.gov website. It's um, checkpoint travel numbers going through TSA from 2019, which is the blue line, which up here over 2 million, almost 2.5 million, and the red line, which is the current 2020. And you can see it just drop off this shelf, just this massive demand shock. It just fell off. A off a cliff. It's absolutely amazing the amount of activity just not happening out there. You know, so I want you to keep these charts in mind when you're looking at the current economic data that's being reported. It, it could, because most of it is reported with the lag, it tells you what happened. And the impact from the coronavirus has not really been fully measured yet and is not being reported in econ economic numbers. 
So as you see more and more numbers like the retail sales, like the jobs numbers comes through, these shocking numbers, as they're reported, I do think will have an impact on investor psyche and could lead to some negative sentiment, which usually leads, if history is any guide, to more selling in, in the marketplace. So given this frightening backdrop, it's no wonder you know, the federal, the federal government and the Fed jumped in here. You know, the Fed and government used to be different entities, but you know, now they seem to be one and the same with how they're acting, but they jumped full force into the fray to help support the economy. So let's look at what they've done. So the first thing is looking from a government perspective, and it's the CARE Act. I'm sure you've heard about that. Um, it's the largest and fastest stimulus package ever passed by the federal government. Just for a point of reference, we look at the global financial crisis. It was 1.8 billion, and it took 10 months to pass. This first one here took 2.2, and is almost 11% of GDP. It's just amazing. It's just massive. That's 11% of GDP. Um, we are going to have to pay for this eventually. So if you look over here, the federal net debt, which you know this is good. This is much needed. It's a good program. But again, we do see debt rising. We see the budget surpluses, deficits rising. There are going to be long-term economic consequences of this. It is definitely necessary, definitely needed, but we're going to have to pay for this eventually. You know, new support for this is in the works. And you know, when I was writing this, I was writing that scribbles. They just kind of came out with it today. They passed another 484 billion. Um, 310 billion for the Paycheck Protection Program, which again, does a direct money to people who have been impacted by the coronavirus, which is great. 75 billion to hospitals, 25 billion dollars to testing, um, 65 billion dollars to energy. This bill passed the House, no, sorry, passed the Senate and should pass the House tomorrow morning. Um, so again, support is there from the government and we expect that to continue. Um, for those who are interested on the CARE Act, we do have three white papers on our website. Um, they're listed under the resource tab, written by our advisors here. They're great reads. Um, I read them. They're an amazing amount of information. So if anybody's interested, you can type in the question box now. If you'd like to send us a copies, you can request that. Or you can just go on our website under the resources tab. You can look at our white papers. Um, but it is a great resource for you. So we took a look at what the government did. Now take a look at what the Fed did. So the first thing they did, we take a look at the yield curve. The first thing the Fed did was drop rates to low. So this was their first shot across the bow. They lowered the borrowing cost of money. And you can see right here in the short-term curve, the current curve is this blue. This is what the Fed controls, the one month short-term rate down to zero. So again, was at 1.5 going into this and they just out of the blue, just boom, 1.5. This entire cost of borrowing money fell with the Fed rate cut across the rate curve. So as long as you go out, all the rates came down. So again, it accomplished what the Fed was trying to do. It wanted to lower the borrowing costs to kind of give people more money that they could use to spend in the economy. But unfortunately, that didn't work or it wasn't enough, didn't provide enough oomph to get anything done. So again, not done yet. And it just did not prove to be enough support to the credit markets. So they fired second and third shots. And those shots were buy everything, not nailed down the fixed income land. So what we're looking at here is a central bank support, we're looking at purchases of bonds, both historical and expected. The Fed is this gray number right here. And you can see this is a tremendous rise, almost greater than $3 trillion. It's a massive, massive expansion of this bond buying program that they have. You know, and it really is a sea change in how the Fed has acted throughout the past. Those who remember economic textbooks and what the Fed's supposed to do, they're really supposed to be the buyer and lender of last resort when there's nobody else out there. But given everything they're doing, how they're acting, they've really become the first and possibly only buyer of almost every asset class out there. And we'll take a look at everything they're buying soon in the next chart. Again, it's over 3 trillion. And if you look at the entire US bond market, that's almost 10% of the entire bond market they're expected to purchase. And again, that is not very liquid as bonds tend to be bought and held by investors, right? So they're not like equities. You don't have this massive turnover. You buy a bond, you put it into, into your account, you collect the income, and then it matures, you get your money back. So there's not a lot of turnover. So that 10% is a massive intervention into the fixed income market. How can they do this? Well, they brought up the ghosts of the global financial crisis, like TALF, Term Asset Lending Funding Program. 
Special purpose vehicles. We should make everybody nervous when you hear anything special purpose vehicles. That was pretty much the cause of the great financial crisis. So let's take a look at what they've actually done with this program and what they intend to do. So the Fed support came in. The first one came in on March 23rd, second shot. They removed their self-imposed bond purchase limit, or in other words, QE infinity. What does that mean? They'll buy anything. Again, they didn't put a limit on what the amount of money they could buy on anything. Before they had a limit, now they're just going to buy until they don't need to buy anymore. They decide they're going to purchase commercial mortgage-backed securities. They never did that before. Think about commercial real estate, malls, think about office space. They've never done that before and they decided to do that this time. Another big thing they've never done before, they're going to purchase investment-grade corporate credit along with the associated ETFs. So directly intervening in the private fixed income market to prop up and provide liquidity. I mean, it's absolutely amazing that they're doing this. They've never done this before. This is a sea change in terms of how the Fed acts, and they're not really done yet. The amount is about 300 billion as of March 23rd, and again, through the TALF. They're also gonna do it through the PMCCF. These are primary market corporate credit funding facilities. Um, you know, really, never mind the letters, it really is used to support the flow of credit and then also to provide credit. So lending money to employers, to, to private businesses, and making sure that money's sloshing around the economy. And they also created a new Main Street lending program to help small and mid-sized businesses, which they've never done before, right? They've always done with the, the large corporations with just the banks. And now they're actually moving down to the corporate world. So that was the first shot. And then even that wasn't enough, as we'll see in a later chart. So we moved on to the next support, which happened on April 4th. 2.3 trillion, yes, trillion with a T, trillion. They decided again, another sea change. They're gonna purchase fallen angels if they were investment grade before March 23rd. What is that? That's a polite way of saying they're going to buy junk bonds. If a company before the coronavirus hit was investment grade, think about you know an airline. You know, a lot of the airlines were investment, not some most of them were investment grade. Given what we're seeing in air travel, we know they're not gonna be investment grade for long, and they fall down to junk bond status, the Fed will still buy that bond. So again, they're picking winners and losers. They're actually investing in companies that are rated junk by the independent rating associations, which is absolutely amazing. They're gonna provide liquidity to banks in the payroll protection program by taking the loans at face value for collateral. What does that mean? It's a technical way of saying that they're going to provide liquidity for the banks in a backstop if anything goes bad. If they don't get paid back, the Fed's going to take the losses. That Main Street lending fund we talked about, $600 billion. Again, Treasury's going to kick in another $75 billion in equity from the CARES Act we saw. $500 billion to purchase short-term municipal bonds. Again, they're actually directly lending money to cities, municipalities. Never happened before. $35 billion from the Treasury. So you can see where I started talking about earlier where the Fed and the Treasury Department are kind of similar now. They're acting like the same. They're acting together in coordination. And then another $850 billion to expand those TALF, PM, SM programs to lend to kind of grease the wheels of the debt markets out there. Got to stop and take a breath there. That was a lot of information. And again, it was meant to because it's so much support and support is the right word. We haven't really even seen the stimulus like yet. This is really just pretty much support, trying to keep all the boats afloat. Um, again, it's just massive when you take a step back at the big picture and just think about it. Two point trillion dollars put into the market to try to keep the support up. Absolutely amazing. So given all this, the next question we have to ask ourselves, did it work? Did they accomplish what they were trying to do? When we look at those spreads again, we talked about the spreads earlier. This is another way to look at the spreads. We're looking at it, the historical ones from investment grade, high yield, mortgage backed US agencies. Remember, we talked about the Fed saying they're going to buy some junk bonds, they're going to buy corporate credit. And you can see, as coronavirus rolled out, we saw spreads blowing out, starting to widen in history. And then we saw, as all of them, they came back down. That's the Fed. The Fed accomplished what they wanted to do, or at least a majority of what they wanted to do. They wanted to lower the borrowing costs for companies in America so they can lend more and increase economic activity. Mission accomplished, at least in the short term for this. Again, I'm not sure how long this can stay depressed. We do think this may blow out again, but at least they stopped the immediate rise. 
This also has an impact in equity markets too. So did they accomplish what they wanted to do with the equity markets? Well, yes, they did. So what we're looking at here is S&P, and this red is junk bonds, the ETF, emerging markets, green is international, and the black is small cap. So we saw going into the crisis, we had a big sell-off in the marketplace. March 23rd, you can know the red arrow, that's when the Fed intervened or made their announcement, almost at the bottom of the market. And we saw this nice rise. So again, did they accomplish what they were supposed to do? Yes. Looking at the second one, April 4th, markets rose, then started coming back down again. And the Fed intervened again, and we saw it kind of jump up. So the market rose in reaction to the support. And that's what it is, support, not stimulus. It's just really keeping the boats afloat. And the next question is, is the Fed just really reacting to the market? Or are they actually seeing something that we're not and, and trying to support it? I do think it's a little bit of, bo of both. I think they are kind of with the market trying to support the markets. And anytime this market tends to drop, at least in the, recently, we've seen the Fed jump in. So that leads to the question, do they have anything left? Well, they do. I mean, they, always, they, have, they can print money like crazy. Um, they could buy true junk bonds, not ones that were investment grade last month, but actually true junk bonds. They could buy equities. Um, I'm not sure they want to make that leap, and I'm pretty sure they're not going to. Again, once you get down to that level, they're really going to stop picking bit, the business of picking winners and losers in the economy. And if you want to talk about moral hazard, that's the 100% pure moral hazard, they're picking winners and losers, who to lend to, what stock to buy. So I don't think they make that leap, but they do have some ammunition left. I just don't think it's going to be enough to keep everything afloat. So that's the here and now and the past. What about the future? And what we're looking at here is expectations for the global growth put together by Goldman Sachs. Um, I use Goldman Sachs a lot. One, they put together nice, good, ch clean charts for us. And two, they tend to be consensus. Um, Goldman never goes too far out on the limb either way, either conservative or aggressive. And whatever numbers they have pretty much is consensus. So we're looking at what they think for global growth. 2019 is the actual. We can see that the world grew about 3%. Look at the consensus for 2020. They still have growth, which is more of a data timing issue. Again, as we're trying to find a signal through the noise, we don't think this is updated yet, but Goldman has updated it for the coronavirus. And you can see that they're looking for a 1% drop in GDP growth in 2020. You know, look at the US, just massive 4% drop, euro area, euro area, almost 9% drop, which is one reason why we're not too excited about the euro area, even with the evaluations we saw on the CAPE ratio. The interesting part to me, if you look at this, you go back to Goldman Sachs in 2021. And again, remember, they're not the extremes. They're more consensus. They got us, got us going back to 5% growth in 2021. Again, given everything we've seen, 3% growth in 2019, a 1% drop in 2020. Again, that's taking into account the impact from the coronavirus up to 5% in 2021. You know, so basically what they're saying is an economic contraction is a blip and we're back on track in 2021. Now, I'm not really sure this is achievable. I mean, given the depth of the economic contraction we're seeing so far, you know, do we really return right back to normal? I mean, how will social distancing affect the forward numbers? You know, current revenue and spending habits, how does all that affect it? I don't see it increasing. You know, if anything, I see everything decreasing. So I'm not really sure um, how we get to the, how Goldman gets to this 5% number, um, or how we do get there at all as an economy. So that's the global growth. Let's take a look at the equity market and take a look at one thing that's been supporting the market for a while is corporate buybacks. As you saw in the Q1 factor performance, investors at least are starting to realize that companies will not be able to spend as much as they have in the past, which is why we saw those dividend stocks. They're not gonna be able to pay those dividends, which is why we saw those perform poorly. And it's not just dividends, it's also buybacks. So again, another chart here from Goldman, look at the performance of high outpaying stocks compared to the S&P, you see it really went low here. So, you know, those paying out dividends really fell off a cliff. And you can see why. When you look at buybacks, look at what the expectations are. 2019 was almost 800 billion. We're down, cut that in half. So a 50% drop. It's just massive. You can see it right here, almost down to $300 billion. It's just amazing. So again, massive cut to business spending. And 
given the massive cut in business spending we expect, this could really hinder the recover, any recovery we see. So again, not going back to those previous growth rates that we've seen before, which had the tailwind of these buybacks and these dividends added. Not sure we're gonna get there. So speaking of earnings, I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing to me what we're looking at here. And what we're looking here is previous crises. Again, look at 2008, uh, great financial crisis. Remember 2015, 2017, we had a short term kind of blip and you see, once we write down the current earnings estimates, the next year's go down too. So again, think about that. This would be 2020, the blue. Previous crisis, yep, falling down because we know the crisis is going to hit. Then they adjust the next year's, right? Again, during a recession, during earnings fall, we know that it affects the next ones. We haven't seen that yet. Again, they're still expecting, and this is consensus um, across the board, earnings growth in 2021. Again, that's hard to reconcile with what we're seeing on the ground in reality that 2021 is just going to be business as usual and even given the steep sell-off that we're just going to go back to normal. I just don't see it. Again, especially since previous recessions, future earnings estimates were also reduced. You know, I don't know how this is maintained. That leads to the question why, right? The people aren't stupid. Um, you know, I'm not sure. It's something I struggle with. You know, maybe investors are just optimistic that with all the support being thrown at the market, economic activity will bounce back, we'll get that V-shaped recovery. Um, but I'm, I'm just not seeing that in the data. Um, you know, I'm not sure how that scenario can play out given the data. I guess anything's possible, but given what we've seen throughout history and what we've seen in economic data, we just don't see how that plays out. Drilling down a little bit further into earnings, again from Goldman Sachs, but like I said, they're pretty much consensus. Um, anytime we look at their numbers and look at earnings for 2019, these are actual earnings. So S&P companies earned $165 um, last year per share. 2020, Goldman estimates that given the impacts of the coronavirus, what we're seeing, that the companies are only going to earn $110 per share. So that's that growth. But again, thinking back to that global growth they're seeing, that's a 33% drop. 2021, they're right back to a higher rate than they were back in 2019, a 55% growth from the depth of the 2020. But again, when we look at this, it's amazing. That 170 to 21 number right here, I mean, it represents 3% growth from 2019. Really? Do really think we're gonna grow from what we experienced in 2019, given what we're seeing in the coronavirus? Just, again, just doesn't make sense to me. And even that we look at the current PE, because I hear a lot about, oh, well, we're pretty inexpensive PEs, but that's going back on 2021 earnings. We look at 2020 at 110, you're at 24 times. Um, back in the peak of the market, back in February 19th, we're only at 19 times. So again, we're still expensive given the current earnings. Even if we move out to this 170, and I don't think this is going to happen, but let's say best case scenario, V-shaped recovery, we go out, this still represents six time, 16 times earnings, which is about historical averages. You know, So even if this comes to pass, do you really want to pay average prices for the above average risks, it doesn't really seem like a good investment program in my mind um, to do that. So again, we still think stocks are expensive, still think there's some more downward pressure on prices here given what we expect to fall out from earnings. And we are starting to see some earnings kind of roll through now, we're in just in the beginning of earnings season. So let's take a look at something, a technical picture here, the Fibonacci chart. So what is Fibonacci? Fibonacci is a technical analysis that calculates basically a high point to a low point and calculate your retracement. Um, it's based on the golden ratio, if for anybody who's really interested and from the Fibonacci numbers. Um, if you wanna go into details about that, we can always talk about that later, but just th the feedback to know is that technical an analysis uses this for the market. So what we're looking at here is from the top, which is again, February, 2020, to the bottom, which is March 23rd, how much has the market risen back to recover that? So there are key points along the way that markets must overcome before they get back to the new heights based on the Fibonacci retracement levels. The first one is 38.2, and we, we definitely passed that. Second one is 50. So again, you can see right where we're hanging out there, and we're actually right at this spot now, this 2783. You know, again, why am I showing this? Why does this matter? History. It's kind of interesting. If you look at history, back in 2001, the dot com, we had the fallback going up to 50%, 50% retracement level, right back down. Right down. 
Go back to 2008, great financial crisis, 50% retracement level, right back down. Looking at the current bull market, right back down, going up, and we're right at the 50%. Now again, this doesn't mean history happens again because history doesn't repeat, but it does often rhyme. So this is one of the real levels we're looking at to see if this holds, we don't go through this, we could be in for some more pain ahead as we've seen in prior <clears throat> bear markets. So again, it's just interesting. It's something we look at. Um, we look at multiple lenses, so we don't look at just one thing. So it's just not looking at this, but people do use this. So sometimes it becomes, even if it, we don't think there's any magic in those numbers, if people do, it becomes a self-reinforcing feedback loop because they think it matters, it matters type of thing. So again, I think it's interesting to see these levels where we saw in past crises and that we're right there now. So again, we're at these crossroads. We can go either way. So that's kind of basically looking at the markets. Now I want to take a step back and try to look, look at our risk model, portfolio positioning, and as always, try to find the signal through the noise. So this is our Stonehoff Capital risk model. And you can see a sea of red as to be expected given what we're seeing in the marketplace. So again, as we're aware, we look at the market through multiple lenses, technical, valuation, macro, and qualitative. Again, need good technicals to have strong bull markets. We do think price matters, so valuation support is good for bull markets, and we need a strong economic environment to lead to higher prices. So that's why we look at those. Looking at it from the technical, you know, negative across the board as all major support levels were taken out. Again, all the moving averages, everything is just ugly across the board. Reversion is the one that's not as extreme as a structure, you know, and that's really because that VIX, that VIX level we saw was up there and elevated, which is a contraindicator. But again, looking at the technical picture as a whole, it's negative across the board. In terms of valuation, last time we spoke, we're back at neutral, um, we were negative, minus six, we're still at negative, but we're minus two. But again, the house saw a slight improvement, but that was really due to that dividend indicator that we have. And the dividend indicator is based on the trailing 12 months. And as we saw, the historical level of dividends are not going to be sustainable. So the movement we're seeing represents more noise than signal. And if we look at the total signal from the valuation indicator, definitely points to a negative valuation picture. In terms of the macro, Again, we saw some decline as to be expected. You know, we moved to negative camp, and we do expect this to fall further as we have not seen a majority of the economic impact from the coronavirus in the data yet. Stay tuned. We'll see that impact come through um, in the next few quarters. So looking at the weight of the evidence, looking at it through multiple lenses, it just all leans us towards a reduced risk profile for investors. And how does this translate into our portfolio? So how do we reduce risk for investors? Well, we position the portfolio for what's most likely to lie ahead. And what we've done in terms of trading in the quarter is we've moved to an overweight, not fixed income allocation. So we're now overweight, we're neutral last quarter, but we're being very, very specific in what we're buying. We're not adding to credit here. We're really adding to duration when, in terms of treasuries and especially in the short to intermediate term. So we're really adding to treasuries only and in the belly of the curve, seven years or less, really would not go out further into those long-term treasuries and would definitely not move into credit right here. We increased our overweight alternatives. Um, we added a little bit to our managed futures position and we also initiated a new position in gold. You know, gold was really a nice hedge with all this liquidity, liquidity sloshing around the financial markets due to the government support we're seeing. Still overweight emerging markets. Again, we saw that valuation support it's not a historical lows, but given everything we're seeing out there, and again, there is always a risk that this market does go to the upside. We do see a V-shaped recovery, and we think you do need some exposure, so it's, which is why we're not zero weight equities. We do think emerging markets is better positioned given the valuation support, given the further along they are on the virus, and given how protected they are from the virus a little bit, that they are the best place to be overweight. International developed, we saw it's still a good valuation perspective, but the economic impacts are just astounding. So we went to underweight international de developed and we stayed underweight US. So underweight what we consider risk assets, except for emerging markets, overweight fixed income, focusing on the treasury part and intermediate terms. So under seven years, having a little bit of cash is helpful. So when these markets do kind of bottom out and we get some positive signs across the board, we have some dry powder to put back and find those opportunities and definitely be overweight to alternatives. So to sum up our thinking, you know, the proper risk level is really key. You know, having some exposure to those equities still called for, but you don't want to be a hero. Um, I think there will be a time when you can be a hero, 
I just think it would be prudent to do so at a much lower prices. And I do think we'll get that chance. So that's kind of summing up with some final thoughts in terms of what we're looking at. And looking at it from big three big questions. I did this chart and redid this um, slide 20 times over. I had 42 different data points, then I had five, then I had 10. And I really want to focus down the big picture here. And I think there's really three big questions we're going to have to think about as we move forward here. And the first one is, when will the economic restrictions end and what will it look like? You know, from Stonehouse's perspective, I think they will, will begin soon. Georgia's done, again, whether you agree with it or not, Georgia is opening it up, um, their economy, and some other states are soon to follow. But it's going to be very varied depending on local conditions. Others may last a lot longer. I think the big driving factor for most, most um, individual states really should be the healthcare capacity, right? You know, do they have the capacity to take care of the eventual people who are going to be sick? Not just from coronavirus, but everyday um, healthcare. You know, there's people living, breathing, dying, unfortunately, irregardless of what happens with corona, that need medical attention. And we have to make sure that because corona is out there, it doesn't overwhelm the healthcare system. And think about the ventilators and the PPEs for the healthcare, people on the front line. So the big takeaway in terms of what it's going to look like, it is not going to be this flood of activity. It's not like the gates open and people come rushing out and think about, do you really want to go to a movie theater once everybody says you can go out of the house? Um, so there's no activity that's unleashed. But it's going to be more like small increments of small incremental activity, a little bit here and there, you know, kind of going into the ocean and that cold water on the New England coast. You don't really jump in all at once. You kind of dip in slowly, your toe first and your ankle. And that's kind of what we see. And if that's the kind of economic expansion we're seeing once this virus is the results are lifted, we don't see that V-shaped recovery in that scenario. The second question is really how deep and how long will the current recession be? You know, and taking all the data consensus and take consensus for what it's worth, and you know, these are all just basically um, projections. Seems like we're kind of focusing on a 30 to 40, 30 to 40 percent drop in economic activity due to this. Um, the math of losses definitely working against us here. If we drop 30 to 40 percent, it requires a 50 percent or greater gain. Again, not just same activity, a gain just to get back to even. So again, in order to achieve this 50 percent growth, we need a massive demand recovery. And again, given what we saw with all the economic activity, seeing everything that's out there, knowing that the economy is just not going to open up on the floodgates, we're not sure that that is, is in the cards. So we're not sure we're going to have this. So we think this recession could be a lot longer and a little bit deeper than a lot of investors are thinking right now. And finally, what are the longer term impacts for the economy, markets, and society? I mean, in short, they're going to be massive and we can, really can't comprehend all the changes that are going to happen to us right now. But we have to start thinking about that. You know, we're just beginning to scratch the surface. You know, but changes in consumer spending are surely in the cards. You know, we have to find a way to pay for the support being provided. You know, higher taxes for somebody. I'm not sure who, but there will be higher taxes. There's no way around that. Um, social distancing, you know, restaurants have to cut down the amount of people they serve on any nightly basis. You know, sporting events. Do you really want to go sit in a stadium with 20,000 people watching an event? Um, that brings a rise to the virtual world. Is it more virtual sports now? Is it more esports? Um, do people stay at home more? You know, it will create opportunities and risks. Um, again, those are three questions we're really looking at. And just to close out here, just so you know, kind of summarize what we're thinking about all this, you know, to justify the bull case, you really need to believe that all the intervention in the market that we're seeing causes a quick V-shaped rebound in economic activity that is greater than we had in 2019. Or cash is just so cheap, again, being liquidity so much that you have to buy something. And the Fed will step in and, and always as a buyer of any financial asset that's experiencing a large decline in value. As you should be fully aware by now, I'm really not in this camp. I do think we change our behavior. And I think the negative economic effects are long lasting and consumer behavior will be impacted. I do find it tough to see a V-shaped recovery and I don't think the Fed can support the market forever or even long enough to get us through this downturn, we are in for further pain. We may not revisit the recent lows, but I think we at least get to the neighborhood. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for paying attention, listening to this long presentation, but there's a lot of stuff to go through and we're living through, you know, trying times here we haven't seen before. 
and I'll turn it over to Amanda for any questions. Hi, Chris. Thanks so much. Um, just as a reminder to everybody here, right there on your GoToWebinar control panel or taskbar, um, you can go ahead and submit some of your questions there. We do have about five minutes. If we don't get to your question, Chris or myself will reach out to you after the webinar. We'll make sure that we do get your question answered. But Chris, I do have just a couple to get started. Uh, yeah. Given the poor economic data, uh, why do you think um, the market is rising? I wish I knew. Um, again, great question. Um, again, the market is made up of thousands, millions of participants, and trying to read read the tea leaves to what they're all thinking at one time is tough. Um, but that being said, I'll give it a go. Uh, I really do think this is a liquidity rally. Uh, you know, it's really more of short-term positioning than long-term investing, right? So traders are adjusting their exposure on a day-to-day, minute-by-minute time frame, and moving prices around. Without the liquidity in the marketplace, you know, with all these traders following the same signals, any small move that traders are making have a larger impact on prices. So I think it's just people moving this positioning around, closing out the positions on a day-to-day -day basis and not really long-term strategic investors who see brightness ahead. They're just trying to adjust their allocations. And without liquidity in the marketplace, you really see the prices jump. And again, people did get some good news. We saw some intervention and people like to feel good. And we look at that volatility chart. And then when we look back to the beginning, we show that volatility, recent experience says volatility is short, sweet, and goes away. We th do think this time is different and we need to take a lo much longer time frame view. And in that case, I think they're just kind of getting a little bit ahead of themselves here, uh, but we'll see. Uh, Chris, the next one, um, what are your thoughts on the Fed specifically? Do you think that they're done intervening in the markets? Um, no, um, I don't think, given the recent history that they're done. Um, I definitely would expect more Fed intervention. But I think there is a limit to the impact, right? Again, think about just keep firing the arrow over and over again. Eventually starts wearing down. The first one has the greatest impact. The second one has a little bit less. Third one has a little bit less. Fourth one has a little bit less. And finally, just like I've seen this show before it's not helping and i'm done so i do think they keep stepping in i don't think they go a bridge too far and stop buying equities and the real junk bonds again i could be wrong um, but reading the tea leaves i don't think they really want to step in to the marketplace and pick wins and loses so i do think you're going to hear more from the fed in the end i just don't think it's going to matter they don't have enough and they won't have enough to stave off what's it's just economic activity. They cannot create demand out of the thin air. They can create liquidity. They can't create demand. And until that demand comes back, they're just going to be spinning their wheels. Chris, what do you think has to happen here um, to jump back into the equity market? There's not one thing. Um, if we always look at the entire picture through multiple lenses, we look at our risk model, we look at it through technical, we look at it through valuations, we look at it through macroeconomic. So if we saw that turn positive, we start seeing to get better signals from that. And I think that um, you know puts us right back in the case of going back into the equities markets. I don't think anybody should actually leave the equity market most cases, and we still have some equity exposure. So again, it would be adding to it, not going back in. Um, but as a value investor, I really want to see the valuations improve, you know, in the both equity and fixed income space. You know, I want to see that valuation get to much more reasonable levels, something we saw closer to the, to the global financial crisis, because when we look at the economic activity and expected economic activity, it matches more closely with what we saw in the global financial crisis than what we've experienced since then. So I'd like to see the levels kind of get back to somewhat similar to crisis level equity, um, valuations. Um, Chris, why do you think that the stimulus is not going to work in pushing financial markets higher? Yeah, I'm, I mentioned that um, again. I, I, they do call it stimulus and you hear about that all the time, but it's really just support. We haven't really done stimulus, stimulus yet. We're just kind of keeping the boats afloat, making sure people who are out of work, who don't have any income, have some income. Making, making sure that businesses that don't have any cash flow to pay people because there's no demand. Uh, have some cash to pay people. So again, that's just kind of support, not stimulus. And they're creating liquidity, right? Not demand. So as much as the Fed gives someone money to stave off the inevitable, they can't do it forever. You know, if demand doesn't come back, no amount of buying financial assets by the Fed will keep us out of a recession. And if we go into a recession, financial asset prices will go down. 
Chris, for the essence of time, I think I'm just going to stick with this last question here. Uh, sure. How often do you update uh, the summary risk model? And if it's available, where can I find it? Sure. Um, we update that monthly. Um, doesn't mean we don't constantly look at the markets. It's not like we update it monthly and walk away. I'm constantly looking at it, but we actually put it together monthly and that was by design. Again, we want to take as much emotion out of that as possible. And what you find is that if you do it as needed, as soon as you get emotionally involved in a marketplace, either good or bad, you tend to update the model. So you want a nice scheduled time frame to remove emotion. And we decide the month is you know, long enough to capture new data and also not long enough that we miss anything that's important. So every month, but we're constantly looking at the numbers. Um, we don't post it anywhere on our website. Um, we do post where we stand on that in terms of green, yellow, or red. So we look at it from you know, bull, neutral, there, we have that, a traffic light on our website um, that'll show us the overall model level. That being said, for our clients, they have access to me, you know, pretty much any eight to seven days a week. Um, I, would, I would appreciate you kind of stick to the five work days in the work week, but we're there for you anytime you need us. You can give us a call, we can go through the model, and I'm happy to discuss it anytime. So, again, at a big high level, you can look at the traffic light on our website. Uh, if you want to get into more details, give us a call at the office and we can kind of go through it. Chris, thank you so much for all of this information. I know it's kind of a crazy time right now um, for everybody. And uh, Chris and I are actually joining you on this webinar from home. Um, so this is new for, new for us as well. So thank you for joining us. I hope that you all are staying well and safe during this time. Um, our next scheduled CIO's Corner is scheduled for Tuesday, July 21st. That's at 12 p.m. Um, you can go ahead and sign up for that on our website as well. And of course, um, if any pertinent information comes up in the meantime, we do host webinars pretty regularly if we feel we have a lot of information that we want to bring to our clients. Um, so we'll certainly keep you notified of all of those things. Um, and again, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. We hope that everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you. Everyone stay safe. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.